and um, you know he is just so magnificent he is the god of the universe there was the song that i that i listened on on vision radio and it was singing god is the god of the universe and the stars are his fireworks um i try to sing it god is the god of the universe but I, i've forgotten the melody already but i sing it when i sing it in my mind it sounds beautiful <laughs> it's like perfect <laughs> but when it comes out <laughs> it doesn't sound so good but god knows I mean it well. <laughs> it's such a beautiful song. But God created everything. And, and his work is so evident in, in what we see out there. He created the whole entire universe. Um, and he's put so much thought into each and le- every little thing that he's done. And then if you look at just a tiny little flower and you just study the little patterns inside, the patterns inside the patterns, have any of you ever just looked at a flower and you think but God actually spent time in creating these beautiful flowers and animals and everything and he's created it magnificently he's created it beautiful his imagination and his creativity is beyond what we can fathom that's our God and he qualifies to be the ruler of the universe he qualifies he overqualifies You know, I work in HR, I work, I've got a normal job Monday to Friday working in human resources, I work with people, and we often have to employ people to work for us, and we recently had to employ a new CEO um, about a year ago, and actually the board of directors had to study all the resumes to make sure we found the right leader who's got passion for our company, who's got the right heart, and... um, but also leadership skills and and qualifications and experience so that we can feel safe with a manager or a CEO that actually knows what they're doing. Do you know that God's resume (laughs) is absolutely amazing? You know, it's the word of God. And all we see is just that little bit of word that we have in this time frame. He's been in existence for eternity. He's got experience beyond what we can comprehend. He qualifies to look after us. I think he knows what he's doing. And we can feel so secure. We can feel so comforted. We can feel so blessed to be able to have a creator that's the boss, the big boss, that's the ruler and the creator of the universe who looks after us. (laughs) And everything that he does, that we see around us, reflects him. Everything you see. You can see that everything is imparted, even in us as humans. Often I look at the creativity. I mean, Bev did a play last year, and it took my breath away. Thinking, how, where do they get these ideas? Well, they are created in the image of God. Even if you look at movies, I mean, I have got a watch that can ring, and I can actually talk to it. When Bev phoned me this morning, I was talking on my watch. It's still brand new. I'm still trying to figure out how to work it. And I was like, whoa, 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 bad phone. <laughs> I'm like, hello. <laughs> I can talk to my watch. We only saw that on sci-fi movies many years ago. I'm like James Bond now. <laughs> I can talk to my watch. But this is what humans can do. We see we've got unlimited ability to create with only a little bit of knowledge we got from God. And I've got a surprise for you, whether you are saved or whether you are unsaved, whether you believe in God or not believe in God, you've been created by God. Whether you believe it or not, you can confess every single day, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist, da, 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 da. You are created by God. Nobody can escape that. You've been created by the creator, and he's made us beautiful, and he's given us this artistic abilities to create and design things. And I want to speak this morning, I've got actually a slide that I want to show up, because I want to speak about Michelangelo. I mean, Michelangelo was one of the world's greatest sculptors in history. He created two statues that I know of. Um, He created many other statues too, but two that I know of, and I wanted to actually show them this morning. One is called the angel. But what I love about Michelangelo, who's also created in the image of God, I love his quote that he said when he created the angel. 
And look at that. He says, every block of stone has a statue inside it. And the task of the sculpture is to discover it. I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved it until I set him free. That's beautiful. And the other statue is one of probably all our favorites, David. <laughs> I love when somebody asked Michelangelo many years ago, how did he create David? What made him think about David? How did he do it? And Michelangelo first fixed his attention on the slab of raw marble. He studied it, and then he chips away all that wasn't David. And you know what? Michelangelo created David, even though he did this masterpiece, <laughs> he wasn't the first one. He's not the original sculpturer. The first one who created David, who really sculpted him, was the sculpturer of all sculpturers, the ancient of days, <laughs> our magnificent God. <laughs> and when he sculptures, he breathes his life into it. And today, my message, the theme of my message is being sculptured by God. Allowing God to sculpture us. And this message has just touched my heart. God has taken me through such a journey with this message. And I really pray that everybody, maybe I'm just preaching to myself this morning. So just enjoy me being blessed by God. But I pray that God will, will also give each and every person that revelation of being and allowing him to sculpture him. So when let's look at the word sculpture because um, um, the word sculpture in itself, you need to find someone who's talented to sculpture you. Hello, we've been sculptured by the creator of the universe. <laughs> I think his resume is pretty awesome. <laughs> and you can trust that he's going to do a good job. <laughs> you can trust him. Now, the word sculpture, there's a few words, and the, the, the verb for sculpture is to, to make or represent a form of something, to carve something, to cast something. Other synonym, synonyms for the word is to, to sculpt, to carve, to chisel, to model, to fashion, to form, to shape. This is all forming, shaping, designing, making something. Now, David, I just want to use him as an example. Even though he was a normal human being, he had a mom, he had a dad, he had a lot of brothers who hated him. He lived in a little town, he was born in a little poor little town, and he was raised a normal little shepherd boy. He was a normal human being. He had a mom and dad, and he loved his mom and dad. That's his flesh. If you asked him on earth, how did you come to earth? He would say, I've got my mom and dad. But you know what was different about David? He also knew that he was created by a creator. And that's the difference. And he could see, you can see that in his, in, his, in, his, in, his, in his psalm that he wrote. He knew that he's not just a normal human being. He had a creator. And that creator formed and shaped him. And that's what's so important for us to discover today, that we have a creator. So let's go to Psalm 139. And we're going to read that. Psalm 139, and this psalm, I'm going to read from verse 13 right up to verse 17, and this all speaks about the perfect knowledge that God has of man. And it says, you formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret and skillfully wrought and shaped, that's another word, in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes so, saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when, when as yet there was not even any of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more than the number of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. You see, when God created David in the inmost parts, when he formed him, when he planned his future, when God made David, 
He actually thought about it. It wasn't just something, oh, I want David, that's it. No, he thought about it. And he had thousands and thousands of thoughts about just making David. You see, each one of us are made uniquely. Each one of us look differently. There's been, over there's at this moment, over what, how many billions of people, eight billion people on the planet, and they all look different. Each one has got a different thumbprint. Each one's got a different future. Each one of us, just like David, have been created, and we are God's masterpiece. Each one of you, and this is the emphasis of the message this morning, you are God's masterpiece. He's created you very specific, and He's created you very special. But you see, long ago, our Creator created humans. He created us different than anything else. He created us in His image. He put a lot of thought into us. He put a lot of work into us. But then humans fell, and we were separated from God. And suddenly there was a separation between us and our Creator. But our Creator knew what He did. Because you see, He didn't just make a piece of rubbish. He didn't just make anyone. He made you and me. He made someone very special in His image. And because we were separated, he was prepared to die for us, to die for each one of us, to show us that you're not just an ordinary being. There's something significant about you. You are created in the image of God who created the whole universe. You've been created in the image of the greatest sculpture. You are very special. And God wants to bring this to our attention. And he wants to really make sure I emphasize it this morning because we are very special. God wouldn't put that effort in to die for you and me if we didn't have something special inside of us. And he says, I must repeat it, so I'm going to do it again. God didn't die for you and me. Our creator didn't go out there and say, I'm going to die because of just no reason, but because you're special. There's something inside of your DNA that's not normal. There's something inside of you that's not human. You have been created by the creator of the universe. You are more than just a human being. And God says you have to hear that. You have to believe it. You have to see it. Because we've been robbed. We've been placed on this earth. We have got normal parents. We've got a history. We've got a foundation. We've been surrounded by things, by our jobs, by the people, where we were born, the way we were raised, what we see on TV, everything. But God says, there's more to you. And I died because I, your creator, wants to restore that relationship because there's something more about you than just being human. So give yourself to me. Make me your sculpture and let me chip away everything that's not you and bring the you out of you and set you free. Let's chip away the lies. Let's chip away the past. Let's chip away the history. Let's chip away those bad experiences that said you are a failure. You cannot do this. You do not qualify because you qualify. You qualify. You are born again. God's made you anew in Jesus to do the works that he's done for you, prepared for you many years ago. You are special. You are special. You are new. You are part of God's creation. And we need to wake up to this reality because God's created us very special. And I'm going to read the scripture that I sent to everybody yesterday. <laughs> Let's go there. We all should know it. <laughs> I think I've lost my space. Ephesians 2 verse 10, and it says, For we are God's masterpiece, and He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things He's planned for us long ago. And when I sent this text out, Uta sent me her um, translation, which is the passion. Now I'm going to have to find it. <laughs> I've got to read it, Uta. And um, so I'm going to get my glasses on, but let's see. This is the Passion Translation. 
Okay, I'm going to have to make it bigger. <laughs> but it's so beautiful. Just listen to God. Um, I love the way they say it very poetically. Oh, my goodness. I can't read this. It's too small. Utsa, do you want to read it? <laughs> I'll let Utsa read it. Can you see it there? We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance for our destiny. Oh, how do I move this on? There's a one more. Oh, There's good. one more on the other side. Okay. Okay. Come on. What's happening? Oh, I'm too big. Wait. Anyway, <laughs> the phone just laid up. Like I said, it's still a new phone. I'm still learning to work with it. But that is it. We are God's poetry. <laughs> He's like writing as a, he, he, God is such a, an artist. He's such a creative God. He's got such a, a, an amazing imagination. Just think of what he's thought about each one of you. Each one of you inside, just like the angel statue. There's an angel that needs to be set free. There's a lion that needs to be set free. There's an eagle that needs to be set free. There's the real you that needs to be carved. And we need to say, God, take me. Take this block of square marble and become creative. Don't leave me just to be square. But make me creative. Create me. Create in me what you want me to be and chip away all those lies, all those things that the world has given me an identity, which is lies. We, we should walk into the image of the kingdom that we've been created. And then I pray and I said, okay, God, how do you actually chip these things away? Do you actually really take a <laughs> piece of metal and chip away the flesh? Now, I'm sure you all know that answer. And when I prayed, God said, I discipline. I'm like, oh, discipline sounds like such a scary word. <laughs> and you just imagine this God sitting there with a big stick, and the moment you do something wrong, he's going to zap you. No, that's not how God disciplines. Actually, the word discipline actually means training. And um, even in the normal English dictionary, the word discipline means training. And um, it, it's actually, if you go in the far flex this, um, um, dictionary, it says training expected to produce a specific character or pattern or behavior, especially training that produces moral or mental improvement. So when we usually go and we get some training from God, he wants to improve us. He wants to bring out the person that's inside you, outside of you, and it comes through discipline, comes through setting aside, changing our lives a little bit. And um, Tom Landley, he was a professional football player and a coach. And this was his famous words that he said um, before he passed away. And he said, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. And that is the thing. You get a good football coach. He's not going to say, sleep in every morning, eat junk food, and just rest. Take it easy. You're going to be a champion. And I'm going to cheer you on because you're a champion. And my words will make you a champion. No, he's going to say, get off in the morning. Come on, we're going to run. Don't eat junk food. He's going to train you. And God does the same. He says, I need you to be a soldier for me on this earth. I need you to be my warrior. Not warrior as in worrying, <laughs> warrior as in a soldier. <laughs> I need you to be my warrior. I need you to be ready when I call you. I need you to be obedient. I need you to have a heart after my heart, just like David did, so that when I say go, you go. When I say stop, you stop. When I say look to the left, look to the right, do this, you do it. And if we're not going to be obedient, he's not going to be able to, to use us. And if we're not going to reflect his heart and we're a whole lot of rebels and we, we represent God, we actually represent God, the creator of the universe. We need to get to know him so that we can represent him in the way he is. And he's not all sad and like sitting there with a mean face. What's the word? Sodom. Solemn. 
He's not sad and solemn. He's actually joyful and happy and full of hope and creativity. And every morning, what can I do today to create something that's marvelous? He's a God of wonder, and his creation is ever increasing every day. And he's been doing this for billions and billions of years, and he's not getting bored. There's not one bored day in his life. He's creative. And the more time we spend with him, the more we will become like him. You see, we'll start bearing his fruits. And um, if we go to Galatians, actually last week, um, Trent had the, um, the scripture, Galatians 5, verse 22 to 25, which is the fruits of the spirits, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Trent just spoke on, on joy. And the whole week, I meditated on, on that message and it was such a powerful message. Thank you, Trent. That was really a blessing because we need to change the way we think. We need to rewire our thoughts. We need to start putting some action in. It's something we physically have to do. We have to change the way we think. And if you think about joy and you get that revelation of understanding joy, your life will change. But it can, it's not going to change overnight. You've got to go and practice that fruit. You've got to go and pray and say, Holy Spirit, teach me about joy. And you've got to go make that list. And I hope everybody's made their lists this week. There was also homework from last week. Is things that, you sh that takes your joy away and things that, 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 that gives you, brings you joy. We need to do that and start focusing on those things. The things that you know, it cannot fail because it's from God. Now, the first fruit, and that's why I say you can probably preach on each of these fruits for days. You can probably have a workshop on each of them for days. But... To, you can actually spend time. I know most of my biggest battles that I faced in life was because I took a fruit a day. They say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. A fruit a day, a spiritual fruit a, fruit a day keeps the devil away. <laughs> Just eat your fruits. It's good for you. <laughs> Make sure you pack them in your lunchbox and you say, I've got my lunch today. Today I am going to practice joy because my boss just doesn't look that happy. <laughs> And you know what? God has taught me how to use this, these fruits. And the most powerful fruit is love because God is love. And if we don't understand love, if we don't understand love, we won't be able to use the love of God because God is love. And I know, just as a, as, as a testimony, and I've, I've used this before, and I will just share my story, because sometimes we don't understand when we say practice the fruits. You've got to, it's a gift. The fruits of the Spirit are actually gifts. God has given us these, these fruits as, as supernatural um, fruits that we can use to help us. It's God's secret weapons. Love is God's secret weapon. And I remember long ago when I was still, Stephen was still a baby, I remember. Um, I was still very, very young, <laughs> many years ago when dinosaurs still lived. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I just thought that's a good joke. Anyway. <laughs> Long ago, when I was young, I was working in this company, and there was this lady that worked there, and she just hated me and wanted to get rid of me. And I was on her list of, sh when she had, she had a blacklist, if your name came on the list, you're going to be fired. So I was on the list. I was told, you're on the list, you're next. So I tried everything. I thought, I'm going to have to just love this lady. I went home, I prayed, Lord, teach me just to love her, because I, <laughs> I don't want to be fired. <laughs> and Anyway, so I prayed for her, and I did all, I, I did everything I had to do. I loved her. I went to work. I greeted her friendly. I was just so nice to her, but she kept on hating me. As a matter of fact, she hated me even more. And then I go home, and I say, Lord, you told me just love her, but I love her, but she hates me. So what am I doing wrong? And he said, you don't really love her. So I thought, okay, now I'm going to really love her. I will go and be extra nice. I'll be this, I'll be that. I tried everything for days, for weeks, and it just went downhill, downhill, downhill. And every time I prayed, he said, you don't really love her. You don't, and I, thought, I don't understand. I don't know what to do anymore, you know. And he said, have you ever prayed and asked me to show you how I love? You see, it's, it's a gift. And I prayed. I said, okay, Lord, let me see her through your eyes. Let me love her the way you love her. And I started praying for her, and suddenly I had this revelation. It was like a life flashed before me of why she does what she does. And I got this love for her. 
She became, she felt like family. I couldn't explain it. It was supernatural. It wasn't, it wasn't my love. It was God's love. It wasn't something I was practicing, I was saying, I was doing, and there was condition to it, like, oh, I love her, but she's not going to love me back. I now couldn't care if she's going to love me or not. I love that woman, and whether she's going to fire me or not, I will still love her. I just felt this incredible love for her. I didn't even speak to her. She started the one day I'm walking past. I didn't even talk to her. And she said, Lorraine, do you want to come and show me how to do this on the computer? Now, that is a sign of your favorite again. <laughs> because I used, she used to, you know, ask only certain people to come and show her how to do things. And if she asked me, it was like, okay, now you're my good spot again. And I was like, what? And I could see a change in her eyes to such an extent that she actually, we became, she was much older than me. And I realized she never had a daughter. She never had kids. She could never have children. And because we were all young and we had all the other ladies that worked, they had little babies, she always had a resentment against anybody who had a child. And suddenly I became like her daughter to such an extent the day when she left the company, she gave me, she came to me and she said, this is a ring that was given to me from my mom. And she said, because you're like a daughter to me, I'm going to give you this ring. And she gave me her ring that was she was going to give to her daughter one day. Purely because I didn't expect anything from her. But all I did is I genuinely felt a love that I cannot explain. And I always now pray, God, show me your love for your people. Show me how much you love them. And you cannot help it. You just feel a love for people that you can't explain. And it's supernatural. And people don't just then see it or hear it. They can feel it. And it changes the atmosphere. Because now it's for real. And it's not just from human nature. It comes from God. You see, love is from God. And the Bible says if we don't know how to love, we don't know God. You can only love if you know God. And um, I think one of the biggest things I said, God, what do I need to chip away? And he said the biggest struggle people have with love, with identifying and finding my love, is they have fear. Fear is the biggest separation from separating us from God's love. Because fear causes anxiety. Fear causes us to doubt. Fear causes us to think that God doesn't love us, that we're not special, that we can't do anything. Fear just brings obstacles. But the moment you spend time with God and you start to know how much God loves you, then suddenly the fear gets out the way because the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And if we have perfect love <laughs> and we have God's love, we will have boldness in the day that we get when we walk into heaven. Let's just read that scripture. Um, perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4 verse 17 to 19. Let's read that. 1 John 4 verse 17 to 19. It says, love has been perfected amongst us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Why are we like him? Because we've spent time with him. We've allowed him to chisel away all these things that's not us. To just get away from the flesh and allow the real us to come outside. And he says, um, in this world, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who has fear has not been made perfect in love. The more we love God and the more we understand. You see, love is a two-way. Love, number one, you, you've got to learn, first of all, how much God loves you. You cannot love until you know how much he loves you because he first loved us. And if we understand his love, we walk around with confidence. Do you know if you know you're loved, if you know that you've got a, a husband or a wife or a mom or dad or somebody who loves you or even your boss, you just walk around with confidence. If I know my boss is happy with me, I walk around like a champion. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get fired and I've got my job and they're happy with the work I've done. I'm going to pay the bills. <laughs> but if you're, there's problems, then you start walking around in fear. 
So the same way with God. If we, you see, the first time man entered fear, man never used to have fear. Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony with God until they sinned and were separated. So that knowledge of sin separated them from God. And for the first time, Adam said, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid. The first person ever to say the word afraid was Adam, and that was after he sinned. But now that has been restored. We're back with God, but the message has still been handed down. We haven't been able to reject that message and put it aside. And David didn't do that. You see, David called himself the beloved of God, the man whom God loved. David speaks to himself as, you love me, God, and you will, that's why I know you'll do this, because of your great love to me. Do you know that John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved? He didn't even call himself the name. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved because he knew God loved him. And he knew that it pleases God if you say God loves me. And it pleases God even more if you have a revelation that God loves you. Because God knows you will be confident in whatever you do because you've got God behind you. You know that you got him. So it's important that we understand God's love because if we understand that, we can love. And we can give that freedom Freely that love, even if we get rejected. I always say, if you go out and you witness to somebody and you want to testify and they reject you, that's an opportunity to show love. Because God loves no matter what. And all of us have got a creator. That is God. Um, I just want to, um, when the worship team, if the worship team can please come up, I just want to end with this, this story. Um, and you might have all heard about this story. And um, I don't know if it's a kiddie story or a grown-up story, but I like all stories. <laughs> but there was one day a lion that was a little lion cub, and he was raised by sheep. Anybody ever heard the story of the lion being raised by sheep? So this lion, because he was raised by sheep, he sounded like a sheep. He flirted like a sheep. He ate like a sheep. He was scared like a sheep. He always watched his back. Is there anybody that's going to kill him? He was at the bottom of the food chain. He's going to, he's got to, he had to watch his back. But as he, as the, the, the little flock that they were in were grazing some nice, delicious green grass, they were moving closer and closer to the jungle. And then one day out of the jungle jumps out this big king of the jungle lion. And he jumps in amongst all these sheep and he just wanted to, Eat, eat them and they started running but this lion the king of the jungle suddenly saw there's a lion and he's running like nothing so he thought i'm going to chase that lion so he chased this sheep lion and the sheep lion is running for all his life and suddenly the big lion caught him and the sheep lion was just going please don't eat me <laughs> and the big lion was going i beg your pardon what are you doing here and he's going, please don't eat me. Please, please have mercy on me. Please, I still have a mom and a dad and I've got all these other beautiful little sheep cousins. Please don't eat me, please. And the lion goes, I beg your pardon, what are you doing here? And this, the more this little sheep lion was begging and crying out for mercy, the lion just took him and dragged him away, kicking and screaming. And he's just counting his last moments. His life is flashing before him, counting all the little sheep, (laughs) getting the time by. He's going to die. And so the lion took him to the water, and he says, have a look in the water. So the sheep lion goes, and he looks. And he looks at the big lion, and he goes, and he looks again. And he looks again. And he looks, and he realizes for the first time in his life, that he's a lion. <laughs> and he gave this big, huge roar. <laughs> and his life changed from that moment. It only took him a second. But the big lion had to drag him away from all those sheep that lied to him all his life. The lion had to drag him away from all these things that he believed that he was and put him back on the top of the food chain. <laughs> and that's the same. Sometimes God chases us. God sometimes chases you. And you might all be very familiar with this. He says, come on, you can do this. 
come on, and he pushes us. Come on, you can do that. And we go, no, leave me, leave me, leave me. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Come on, you can do this. You're not scared to talk. Come on, you can sing. You've got a gift. You've got talents. Look at what, you've got an influence at work. You can speak to people. You've got a mouth. You've got a brain. You're creative. And you go, no, 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 I'm not called. And God says, come on. And sometimes he has to take us, a bit screaming and shouting. And then he takes us to the word. And um, we see our reflection and we start realizing we actually created in the split image of God. We actually 100% the children of God. Your creator is a marvelous creator. The best sculptor of all time. He's created each one of you so uniquely that I don't even have the authority to tell you what your future is because he has got it in the palm of his hand. He knows why he's created each one of you, not just for this life, but for the life to come. The one that David saw many, many years ago. David's already there waiting for all of us, cheering us on. and probably very happy that we often speak about him (laughs) and giving God glory. (laughs) But so we need to be. We need to allow God to find us. He sees inside that sculpture. He sees inside that statue. And he wants to bring us out so that we can fly I believe because we've been lied to so many times, and I'm just saying this in boldness, I don't think we know what we can really do because I don't think there's a human on this earth who's actually really, really gone so close to God that they actually can know. You would see that. They will stand out. You'll be able to see the reflection of God in someone who spends a lot of time with God. We will do things... If Jesus says something, he doesn't lie. And when Jesus was on the earth, he says, greater things that I've done, you will do. While you are on this earth and in the future, that's the word that Jesus left us with. You can do great things. And no matter your condition, don't don't think of your condition. Don't think of your circumstance. Don't think I'm... My life is difficult. I'm I'm in a difficult situation. Do what you can do with your situation where you are right now. And just be the person that believes that God is far greater, far bigger, far higher. And can do far abundantly above what we could ever imagine or even comprehend and think. Allow God to discover and let you be free and fly. You are all unique. And God, when, when I prayed for the service and I said, Lord... What is the desire that you have for each and every person here? He said that they can know that they can trust me with my handiwork. Show them my testimony. My, show them my Bible. Show them my resume. They can trust me. Show them how long I've been alive. Show them how long I've been in existence. And let them know they can trust me. Let them know that there's so much inside of them. That is me, that I haven't just put together, just thought of it instantly. No, I have put many, many, many thoughts into each person's life. And numbers doesn't count to God. There could be billions and billions of people who've been alive ever. You are unique. You are so unique. And one day you will see and you will remember how unique you are. But let that person come out. Set that person free. But trust. Trust our God because He is so good. He's so good. He's so marvelous. And He loves us so much. Amen. So as we all pray, I just want to say a little prayer this morning. Lord, as we all sit here before you, Lord, as your children. And while everybody's praying, I'm just praying, Lord, that if there's anybody here this morning who, who hasn't received Jesus, and they know that God's been chasing them, God's been chasing them for, for years now. And even though they've said many times in their hearts, I don't believe in God. I don't, I don't even know that God exists. You are the creator, God. 
They can't escape that. We can choose our family. We can't choose our families. They've been given to us, and we can't choose our creator. He, you are our creator. There's none like you, and you are all people's creators. And Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody here this morning who's not born again, who hasn't given their lives to be chiseled again, Lord, and to, to give their hearts to Jesus, that they would put up their hands. And I just thank you, Lord, that even those people that are listening to this, to this message on podcast and that, Lord, that if there's anybody out there that they would, they would reach out and accept you, Jesus, into their lives. Because it's just a simple little prayer that we need to do, and that's to receive Jesus and believe that you are the Lord of our lives. And then find a good church that they can lead you to Jesus. But this morning, as we all going to stand now and, and worship... I want us to just worship God and, and just surrender to Him. Forget about the person next to you. Forget about even why you come here. Forget about the the lamb in the oven or whatever. But let's just let's just worship God and um, let's just lift our hands and just praise Him because He's magnificent and and say, God, inside me, you know.